Right, I'll introduce us. Um, welcome to Class War and some Class Whores, um, sex worker organising during COVID. Um, uh, today at the Edinburgh Anarchist Book Fair 2021. If you're joining us for the first time um, today or for the first time at the book fair, um, please take a moment just to look over our Safer Spaces Agreement. Um, and that's available to read on our website and I'll post it in the chat in just a second. Um, you can also go to our website and look at the stalls for the day and the full programme um, for the weekend. And it's across two days for the first time, which is really exciting. Um, and it's all online. Um, as ever, the book fair is made possible um, by people giving their time and labour. Um, and we really appreciate that. Um, so all donations will go directly to speakers and organisations taking part. So if you can, please consider directing um, a little bit of money if you can and donating that to our pay PayPal page, which I'm going to put in the chat as well. Um, we're also keen to hear how you've experienced the day and because it's online and we're all like quite disparate. So if you've got any feedback and you can improve uh, things we can improve for the book fair for next year, um, please go to the feedback page on the website. Um, yeah, because we want it to be as accessible as possible to as many people as possible. Um, yeah, so this event is being recorded, but it's not live. So it's going to be recorded and then put up later, but we're going to extract the audio so you can have your videos on and you, you won't be um, recorded for that. Um, I'm gonna hand you over to our, our two speakers today for the talk and um, yeah, enjoy it. Hello. Um, so we confusingly are both called Betty. Um, I think maybe other Betty is gonna be Elizabeth today, if that's okay. Yep, I'll be Elizabeth. Cool. Um, yep, so you've got Betty squared from Scott Pep. Um, do you want to start doing the screen thingy? Uh, yep, yeah. I will do that now. Um, so yeah, in writing this, we've changed it quite a bit. Um, so it's more about just a sort of general radical approach to sex work and sex workers' rights. Um, we do touch on COVID and stuff because it's impossible not to at the moment. But um, yeah, I guess we'll just dive in. Um, so yeah, Scott Pep are a sex worker led charity and we advocate for the rights and safety of everyone selling sex in Scotland. Um, we define sex work as being the exchange of sexual services for both money as well as goods and services. Um, so that would include sort of shelter, illicit drugs, anything like this, as well as money. Um, as an organisation, we advocate for the full decriminalisation of sex work as a means of reducing harms and achieving labour rights. Um, and this is in line with the global sex worker rights uh, movement, as well as the World Health Organisation, Global Alliance Against Trafficking Women and um, loads and loads of others. So um, decrim, full decrim means um, the decriminalization of the sale and purchase of sex as well as associated activities. Um, so that means that the client, the worker and any third parties like managers are decriminalized. Um, I can't see, there we are. <laughs> so obviously as anarchists and uh, not, not particularly like boss loving people, decriminalizing managers and bosses feels icky to say the least but um, it's actually a really necessary part of achieving labor rights for sex workers because when anyone in your workplace or any part of your workplace is criminalized or illegal um, you're unable to access basic labor rights and protections um, because you could threaten the existence of the workplace which is your source of income so if we don't criminalize even people that we kind of don't really want to like managers and things like that who are obviously profiting off other people's labor we actually can't access um rights and support that we we should be able to um the current legal model in scotland and the rest of the uk um excluding the north of ireland at the moment is partial criminalization so the selling of sex is not criminalized on its own but uh many other aspects around it are including um, working together for safety, um, 
some some forms of advertising are seen as legal but rarely prosecuted at the moment. Sorry, there's loads of noise out on my street. I'm going to close the window. So, um, yeah, partial criminalisation um, means that sex workers are vulnerable to abuse from clients, employers, and the police. Um, two sort of key laws that we come up against most are the brothel keeping laws, which mean that um, workers can't work together with um, work together for safety. Um, so we have to choose between working alone and being more vulnerable to violence from clients and things like that, or working together and risking arrest um, and, and all the other things that would come with that. And there's also the laws against soliciting a uh, working out on the street, um, which particularly target the most vulnerable workers um, and push workers into unmonitored and underground areas further away from other people, further away from other workers, um, so that they're less able to practice safety measures and things like this. Um, again, leaving them open to abuse as they compromise their safety whilst trying to make a living. Um, we're ready for the next slide. So decriminalization is not legalization. Legalization or regulationism is a system where sex work in certain contexts is legal, but in most is not. Um, it's usually heavily regulated by the state and doesn't give power back to the worker. So laws around legalization of sex work vary from country to country, but they all hold the underlying need to intensely regulate sex work and the worker. So in Germany, you see um, legal workers have to be registered and hold a sex worker ID card. Health checks are required in order to maintain legal status. And obviously that means that the most precarious, oh, my cat's coming up to say hi. The most precarious workers um, can't comply and therefore will end up working legally. Um, similarly in Nevada, in the States, um, people with criminal records can't work in Nevada brothels. Poor sex workers can't afford to pay the advance fee of 80. <laughs> just so off-putting of um, 80 to 160 euro per shift for red light windows trans women can't work legally in turkey and undocumented migrants can't work legally anywhere um <laughs> really got his bum in my face um and in most countries where uh sex work is legalized the illegal trade is actually bigger than the legal industry so even in attempting to sort of bring it out from the, the shadows and therefore have some protections, actually the illegal and unmonitored, more dangerous side of the industry is huge. <laughs> um, so it basically, legalization creates a two-tier system in which the most privileged sex workers are afforded status and therefore the rights and protections that go along with it, while more marginalized workers are left unsupported and still criminalized. Um, and, and really demonized culturally as well. Um, the system allows the state to punish unregulated workers, seize their money whilst also um, benefiting financially from the legitimate industry. And uh, it lines the pockets of non-sex workers and, benefit, and the benefits are only felt by a small minority. And I think it's Elizabeth's turn. <laughs> so we are now on one okay so to fully decriminalize sex work is to move it mostly outside of criminal law and to regulate it under labor and commercial laws so previously laws were usually designed to punish sex workers and remove their workplaces but full decriminalization will mean that sex work will be subject to the same reasonable laws as coercion bullying assault and rape that apply in other contexts so under this model penalties for street sex work is removed and sex workers can work together or in managed brothels where employers are held accountable under labor law, labor law. New Zealand is the country that has come closest to the full decriminalization of sex work, decriminalizing workers, clients, and third parties since 2003. Unfortunately, this doesn't extend to those without the legal right to work in this country. And again, it creates a two-tier system where undocumented workers still cannot access the same rights and protections as documented workers. And that's an issue that's also really inextricably tied in with border laws and migration policies. Um, since the decriminalization of sex work in New Zealand, workers have successfully brought issues of workplace sexual harassment to the Human Rights Review Tribunal 
winning not only financial compensation for their loss of earnings and emotional distress, but also setting the principle that just because you work in the sex industry, you're not fair game for sexual harassment. So the decriminalization of sex work is a means of building workers' power and reducing potential harms associated with the sex industry. It's not an endorsement of the sex industry itself. So as sex workers get more active in advocating for our rights and safety, sex industry abolitionists have also become more vocal as they call for the complete eradication of the industry. And this emerges from a myriad of perspectives. The mainstream women's sector and radical feminists see it as a product of patriarchal power structures, and the political right views it as harmful to, to traditional values and a threat to public health and a loss of control over women's bodies and economic lives. They make really strange bedfellows, but it's somehow happened. Um, the mainstream feminist answer to the problem of sex work is the policy often known as the Nordic model. It was first introduced in Sweden in 1999 and it criminalizes the client while supposedly decriminalizes the worker. The goal of this policy is to end or challenge demand for prostitution. And it seeks to abolish the sex industry by addressing men's demand for sex. And it believes that this misogynistic demand is the driving factor behind the existence of the sex industry. It really just, fails to acknowledge the much more practical and material demand behind the industry, which is the sex workers' demand for resources such as secure income, housing, food, etc., and for a flexible work schedule that allows time for caregiving duties or mental health needs. These are key to our motivations for being involved in the in this industry and for staying in the industry. So the Nordic model in trying to cut down men's demand for sex really just cuts down resources for the sex worker and doesn't do anything at all to address the poverty and social malfunctions that inextricably feed into the need for sex work. The Nordic model since then has been exported to Norway, the Republic and Northern Ireland, Iceland, Canada, France and Israeli occupied Palestine. While it claims to decriminalize the seller, in many cases, it's applied on top of pre-existing legislation and as such, workers are still criminalized. Far from being a feminist policy as, it, as it's often sold as, the Nordic model has clear harms associated with it, even beyond making the pool of clients smaller and more dangerous. When a client is arrested in Ireland, the police takes away the sex worker's cash as proceeds of crime. Making a sex worker poorer is just going to keep them in sex work. In Sweden, landlords are pushed into evicting sex workers or facing persecution themselves. In Norway, Operation Homeless was the name of a police operation which ran from 2007 to 2011, in which police contacted the landlords of sex workers and pressured them to evict them or face criminalization themselves. Despite the official end in 2011, Amnesty International has recorded people's more recent experiences. Police in Nordic model countries often use sex workers' reports of violence to deport them, and they often do deport sex workers, even if they still have a valid visa and they haven't outstayed them. This model makes workers more vulnerable to both interpersonal and state violence and prevents workers from accessing support and justice, as detailed in the 2019 Red Umbrella Sweden's uh, report, 20 Years of Feeling Sex Workers. The Nordic model makes working more dangerous. There is debate within the sex worker community about whether the sex industry is intrinsically dangerous or violent, but what we do agree on is that criminalizing the client increases the danger. It leaves the sex worker with a much less preferable client pool, the unpredictable ones that don't care about keeping within the law. It also gives clients reason to refuse important screening information such as real names and numbers. This model makes an already huge power imbalance between the worker and client worse. We need to sell our labor more than he needs to buy it. And when people have few or other, no other options, they can't just leave the industry. Instead, they're forced to lower their rates and compromise their boundaries and safety strategies. The first thing when demand is reduced is that the price goes down. Sex industry abolitionists correctly identify the sex industry as a site of violence and exploitation. But the policy, the conclusions they come to, like the Nordic model and Sesta Foster in the US, do more to increase violence and exploitation. The Stop Enabling Sex Traffickers Act and Fight Online Sex Trafficking Act are laws which claim to create safety, but really just removes online platforms which sex workers need to swap um, invaluable intel to help protect themselves from rapists and screen bad clients and earn what they need in order to live. These policies serve abstract ideology whilst dismissing the material needs and lived experiences of sex workers as trivial. 
Anything that decreases power, money and safety strategies for the worker is going to increase exploitation and violence at work. And I will swap it over to Betty. <laughs> oh, wait, where did it go? So, understandably, workers often feel pressure to justify the existence of our means of survival with um, the empowerment narrative. So, um, this is a defensive response to threats of policies which make our work and lives more dangerous, as well as the often visceral and violent and degrading language used to describe us um, and the work that we do by self-proclaimed feminists. Um, you... It, specifically within feminism, you can trace this back to sort of Andrea Dworkin's um, confrontational writing style about her own experiences in prostitution. Um, and while her own experiences are totally her own and she can name them whatever in whatever way she wants, um, the way that she described them and did legitimise and normalise graphic and misogynist language um, within the feminist discourse around sex workers and their bodies. Since then, um, non-sex working uh, writers have likened us to blow up dolls, complete with orifices for penetration and ejaculation, said that our bodies are seminal spittoons and um, you know, academics have claimed that we, are, we experience ourselves as cheap whores. It's no wonder that many sex workers clutch onto the empowerment narrative, um, desperately trying to claw back some dignity and counter the uh, dehumanizing and horrific descriptions of us. Um, it's all the more painful that this is done by people that have never had to never had to rely on sex work as a form of income and a means of survival. Um, there's a lot of respectability politics in the, um, the kind of sex work is like any other form of work. I pay my taxes, happy hooker type chat, um, where we try and legitimize ourselves in order to legitimize uh, the industry that we work in. Um, but it's a super flawed argument. So if there was nothing wrong with the industry, then there would be no reason for there to be a sex worker rights movement. Um, we can't improve something if we can't admit fault with it. And it's really difficult to be sex positive or empowered at work when you are at risk of criminalization, police violence, client violence, or being exploited by a manager and uh, lacking negotiation power. Um, so, uh, and yeah, being empowered is completely subjective and uh, irrelevant to whether you deserve basic labour rights and safety. Um, sex work, like everything else, should be situated within, shouldn't, well, shouldn't be, uh, should be seen as being situated within oppression and patriarchy. Um, and there's loads of class and race privilege, particularly in that empowerment narrative too. Um, and it's also demonstrably untrue. Many of us in the sex industry experience it as a site of real trauma. This cat is getting on an air. He only wants to cuddle when I'm on Zoom. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's a site of real trauma and um, existing oppressions that we face are often brought into much sharper focus as out of necessity, we have to fetishize our own bodies and identities. Um, and yeah, as um, again, out of necessity, we monetize societal power dynamics and allow them to be played out basically on our bodies, um, physically and emotionally. And that takes its toll. So we're definitely not here trying to be like, sex work is great and really empowering. Like, it's shit. And part of the reason that it's shit is because of work. Um, so yeah, as anarchists and people looking for radical solutions and possibilities, it's not enough to see the problem as inherent to sex work though. The problem is inherent to the way that work exists in context of white supremacy, ordered imperialism and patriarchal capitalism. Um, work is exploitative. Having to sell your labor to survive while people farther up the chain profit is violent extraction. And when that extraction is happening literally on your body, you feel you feel it much sharper, but it's the same the same kind of thing. Um, and yeah, how many people love what they do and don't just do it because they need to? Um, people in policymakers love to ask if we would be selling labor, selling sexual favors and labor 
we were not being paid for it um as if anyone else in any other kind of bullshit shitty job would also be working in a call center or doing any other number of things just for the love of it um there are specific harms and dangers associated with sexual labor and this specific form of extraction feels really cutting but when you consider the reality of many other forms of work the act of selling your body is something that most people engage in in some form or another throughout their life um it's really important to be clear that um, I'm making links with sex work and other forms of work, not to legitimize sex work, but to delegitimize all work um, and the way that we construct work and productivity. And it's also important to recognize that sex work is an income generating activity um, and therefore to try and resist the attempts to pathologize us for our choices and that kind of thing. The vast majority of people who, um, who do sex work do it as a means of survival to whichever extent um, and if there were genuinely better options available we would be doing them. The, um, the harms associated with sex work can only be addressed in context of full decriminalisation um, and this must include decriminalisation of migrant sex workers and people with insecure or no documentation and this um, should be seen as in context of fighting against wider systems of border imperialism. Next slide. So borders are pretty key in everything at the moment, especially with Brexit um, on the on the horizon or impending. Um, the hostile environment in the Home Office ramping up detention and deportation of undocumented migrants. Um, so just in general, undocumented people and those in the process of seeking asylum are excluded from mainstream labour markets. Without the right to work, they rely more heavily on what's called black work, including illicit industries like the sex industry. The lack of safe and legal routes to migration also push people into potentially exploitative relationships as they cross borders through underground and irregular means, paying third parties in either money or labour. This type of exploitation is absolutely not specific to sex work and actually um, the figures for sex trafficking are much smaller than the figures for other forms of trafficking including labour trafficking and um, trafficking for other illicit in industries. Um, but yeah, basically trafficking is inextricably tied into border control and migration policies. Um, so there's not always a clear line between um, people smuggling and trafficking. So on paper, smuggling is to pay someone to get you across a border. Whereas if you're trafficked, um, someone has transported you for forced labor and is exploiting you through um, fraud and coercion and force. Um, it's common for people to take on huge debts to smugglers and or traffickers in order to access and in order to cross a border. However, once the, the journey begins, the person seeking to migrate can find that the debt has grown or that the work that they're expected to take on at their, at their arrival destination is not as previously discussed. So suddenly the situation spirals, smuggling becomes trafficking, the line is really blurred between the two. Um, as is in, in different cases, it's, it's hard to know when someone has consented. It's not all Liam Neeson taken, kidnapped, on the street. That's a, a teeny tiny percentage of it. Um, so people smuggling tends to happen to less vulnerable migrants who have resources to pay up front and who already have connections in their destination country, whereas trafficking happens to the more vulnerable migrants who have to take on a debt to leave and have no community in the destination. Um, so they end up relying on traffickers. So trafficking is a direct result of borders and of people's desperation to cross them. And um, this is an issue that many mainstream anti-trafficking organizations fail to address, um, instead using a framework born out of racialized tropes of violent men of color, kidnapping and controlling powerless women, mostly also of color, but also white women stemming from white slavery panics, who themselves have no agency. All the kidnapping chat um, negates the fact that people want to travel and need to travel and it feeds into white saviorism that actually ends up upholding the systems which drive people into these exploitative relationships. 
um, it also fails to address the root causes and instead produces bad policy and deeply misguided projects which aim to save women from the sex industry and trafficking by employing them in, in sex works, for example, um, in sex work, in sweat shops, for example. Um, there are loads of really horrendous cases of people being rescued, um, particularly in Cambodia. And we've got links in the um, in the sheet here. I think maybe I forgot to put them into the into the PowerPoint. Um, so yeah, looking at projects like that, um, where people are sort of funneled into one exploit from one exploited form of work to another really exploited form of work. Um, you can see that it's really important that one of the demands of the sex worker rights movement has to be that access to alternative means of survival is better than other options. Um, otherwise, it just won't be seen as viable. So yeah, um, raids happen on workplaces um, and they're, they're understood, uh, they should be understood as um, immigration raids, even when they're framed by law enforcement and um, the media and things like this as rescue missions, basically. Um, even those who have been trafficked and in really, um, really clear ways um, for either sex or another form of coerced labour are often then criminalised and face deportation. Um, I recently did some training for another job that I do um, with a large anti-trafficking organisation and asked them like, oh, what happens to most of the women that you that you work with uh, once they've been, once they've gone through the courts and that kind of thing. And they were just like, oh, they'll get sent back home. And that really shocked me because I was just like, I don't know that, like, it feels really weird to just be so like, they go home, um, regardless of what they want. And um, having experienced trafficking itself isn't a reason to claim asylum. You can only claim asylum on the basis of um, risk of being re-trafficked. Um, so yeah, the current discourse around uh, trafficking is super unhelpful um, and uh, the policies seek to rescue by blocking routes and sending them home. Um, attempts at addressing the real harms of trafficking without also actively challenging and resisting current migration policy are putting a plaster on a gaping wound. Um, Red Canary Song are a grassroots Chinese massage parlor coalition based in America but working internationally. Um, put it best, saying anti trafficking NGOs claim to speak for migrants in sex trades, promote, sorry, I'll start that again, I got models. Anti trafficking NGOs that claim to speak for migrants in the sex trades promote increased policing and immigration control, which harms rather than helps migrant sex workers. So, yeah, Brexit. The arrest, detention and deportation of sex workers has risen sharply since the referendum in 2016, as have rates of violence and threats to workers. Um, EU nationals now have to justify their right to remain in the UK based on their work and contribution to wider community. Therefore, EU sex workers are in an increasingly precarious position, as detailed in the English Collective of Trust Defutes 2020 report, Sex Workers Are Getting Screwed by Brexit. Um, the report includes a number of cases of case studies, as well as information on how the ECP and lawyers they work with have sometimes managed to successfully re resist deportation orders. Despite the legal rulings, um, which defend EU migrant workers from doing, being deported, UK police still harass and intimidate EU migrant sex workers and threaten, with, threaten them with deportation. Um, Many migrant women are kept out of jobs by racism, endemic low wages, and lack of employment rights and other abuses, so that sex work becomes one of the few economically viable options of survival. Um, UK police have been giving out notices telling women that sex work is not a legitimate job, despite the fact that there's been case law recently that states otherwise, um, and so that they are required to leave the country. Um, once again, women's hard work providing an income, supporting their loved ones and themselves um, at a time of rising poverty, homeless and destitution, homelessness and destitution is dismissed and disparaged. Um, and we're on to the next slide. And uh, 
It's Corona time. <laughs> Remember I'm sick of coronavirus yet? I know I am. <laughs> Do you want to take over? For yeah, me? yeah, yeah. I'll take over. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so yes. Along with many other precarious workers, sex workers' lives have been turned upside down by the pandemic and the subsequent restrictions. So around February and March last year, it became clear to many of us that at some point we'll have to make a choice between safeguarding our own health, the health of our families and communities, and making a living. Each worker has to weigh up, weigh up the risks of each option. So there's the risk of getting COVID and spreading it to others and suffering with symptoms of long COVID versus the risk of just having no or zero income, going into debt and being unable to put food on the table. Um, it's also particularly worth considering here that there's a really high proportion of sex workers living with disabilities and chronic illnesses. Um, this is a result of exclusion from mainstream economies as discussed with reference to undocumented migrants. So for those of us with conditions, there's the added danger of being forced to continue to work in conditions where it's impossible to socially distance. Um, so many workers moved to providing online services, but the ability to do, to do this relies on access to technology, a stable internet connection and tech skills. And on top of that, there's the increasing competition because the platforms are flooded with new workers. And there's a lot of other different risks associated with online sex work, like security, stalking, outing, data protection, revenge porn. It's really not the solution that many people hoped it to be. There's been a lot of articles written on the various ways that um, the various uh, ways sex workers have been affected, and many of them straying into poverty porn and then sort of savior territory. But what's been really quite enlightening for us is a policy around the very little support sex workers have received from the government that allows us to not work whilst under the threat of global, uh, of global pandemic, but still to avoid destitution. So what happened was in the May of 2020, the Scottish government allocated £60,000 for specialised services for women engaged in prostitution during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and uh, the Scottish government stated that the funding will help nine organisations across Scotland increase their staffing and enable women invo involved in prostitution to access support and trauma counselling. So as many of us may need or want counselling in the context of a pandemic that threatens economic survival and physical health, it sort of was quite patronising and inappropriate given the much more immediate and pressing issues at hand. And then on top of all this, the fund itself remained largely inaccessible to most workers because of the lack of understanding of the needs of workers, as well as the ideological and policy factors and general confusion about how the funds can be applied for and distributed. So the money was to be distributed through the Encompass Network, which is made up of nine organizations. The issue is that um, the issue is that all these organizations have to subscribe to the Scottish government's equally safe definition of sex work as commercial sexual exploitation. Um, <laughs> the website itself says all work can have a negative impact on the position of all women to so the objectification of women's bodies. So this really doesn't communicate as a safe or non-judgmental environment for workers. So, you know, if you were to go onto the website, you'd be like, oh, I can try and access some government funding. And then you see that it's really going to put you off going any further. Um, and, you know, it's not about all women. It's this is about sex working women and sex workers who are not women. And to conflate sex working women and non sex working women is really quite harmful to sex workers because it uh, frames us as partly responsible for producing and reproducing patriarchal power structures that we have to interface with. So Scott Pett will be releasing a report on the issues with the Encompass Fund. But through our pre preliminary research, as well as involvement in supporting workers' attempts to access it, we've been, we found that there's been several barriers to access. When workers try to access this, this fund, they were told that the money would be transferred directly to their landlords. Um, this highlights how little the Encompass Network understands the very real precarity that many sex workers live with. Not only do many tenancy agreements hold clauses which give the landlord grounds to evict the tenant on the basis of using the let property for immoral purposes, but if a landlord knowingly lets a property which has been uh, which has been used for sex work, they themselves can be criminalized. So outing a sex worker to the landlord can make them homeless on top of being unable to work during the pandemic. Um, government support for sex workers should make them more economically and materially secure, not less. So this situation has 
underscore the serious policy issues that prevent people working in the sex industry from accessing support, as well as the importance of sex worker led organizations like Umbrella Lane and Swarm at providing peer support. In order to access government funding, as well as a seat at the table when such programs have been created, the organizations must, must, must subscribe to Equally Safe, which is Scotland's strategy for preventing and preventing and eradicating violence against women and girls. And this strategy adop, adopts the position that prostitution and commercial sexual ex exploitation is a form of gendered violence. It also adds that it recognizes that all women engaged in prostitution deserve the support of services without fear of judgment or discrimination. And this has unfortunately not been achieved in practice. The equally safe policy creates bad policy and support projects and it excludes workers who can give vital feedback in shaping support. And its definition of sex work as commercial sexual exploitation also means that sex worker led organizations cannot receive public funding, even though they are best placed to support each other through mutual aid and being involved with direct access to those in the community. So, yep, we're coming to the conclusion of the Radicals Guide to Sex Work and Sex Worker Rights. And um, yeah, we wanted to turn back to a focus on the solutions. Um, what can actively be done in order to provide safety, justice and support for sex workers. So obviously full decriminalisation um, is the best policy for both harm reduction and giving power back to workers. Um, by moving, <coughs> excuse me, by moving sex work out of the realm of criminal law and into commercial and labour laws, both employers and clients can be held accountable for their actions, mitigating workplace exploitation and abuse. Workers can access justice and support and have basic labour rights. So examples of labour rights for sex workers could include, like we mentioned, protection from sexual harassment, adequate breaks, requirement for management to supply safer sex materials and to support workers um, insisting on safer sex with clients, and giving sex workers the right to refuse clients and receive managerial support to do so. Um, regardless of the quote unquote feminist debates about whether or not sex work is a morally or ethically legitimate form of work, marginalised people are still doing it. And um, as they have to exchange their labour for resources in order to survive. For these marginalised people to gain control over their working conditions, labour rights and other rights, such as the right to remain, sex work needs to be fully decriminalised and legalised and legally recognised as work. Um, we don't live in a utopia where the abolition of sex work equals the abolition of misogyny and male violence, which seems to be what a lot of the abolitionist feminists think. Um, and it's not fair to use vulnerable minority as collateral in this ideological war. Um, it's cruel to, want, to not want to improve sex workers' working conditions or even try and make it more difficult and dangerous in order to punish them. Um, which is a key aim of the Nordic model, um, is to make sex working so difficult that you have to not do it without providing other options. Despite feminist concerns, the sex industry in New Zealand hasn't grown larger since it was decriminalised. The numbers have remained stable. Decriminalisation does not make the concept of sexual harassment meaningless because sex work is not inherently rape or sexual harassment. It should not be it should not be hard to understand that the concept of consent applies to sex work as it does to anyone who agrees to have sex regardless of the exchange of money and the argument that all sex is coerced and um, all sex work is coerced therefore rape means that when we are raped it that has no meaning and um, and that is a deeply problematic thing to to come out of a feminist mouth um it's not the presence of money that dictates whether or not a sexual interaction is objectifying. Sex work is not pushed onto job seekers. It's not, um, neither is lap dancing or porn. Um, it's not like it's being given to school students as, as viable options. It's clearly not I, like an ideal job within the society. So this sort of model panic framework of like, but what if we make it legal and then it's all fine and everyone will just be hers is nonsense. Um, Decriminalisation, like we said earlier, is not an endorsement of the sex industry. And I think as radicals, as radical sex workers, we have to be really clear that we don't think that the sex work, that the sex industry is this wonderful place. Um, 
my ideal society it does not exist because my ideal society work does not exist and um yeah like but we're we're not there yet um and yeah sort of abstract anxieties about decriminalization teaches men that women and girls can be bought and things like this shouldn't be put above the the real material needs of people who are working in the sex industry um who particularly tend to be working class um the criminalization of sex work and the messaging of it women's bodies are not for sale has done nothing to stop people from selling sex in those places in the places where that sort of um framework has been popular criminalization just sends out the message that sex workers do not deserve basic human rights safety or justice to decriminalise sex work is to treat um, as important the immediate material safety of people selling sex. These needs are not trivial. It's not enough to defend sex work based on freedom of choice or simply try to tackle stigma. The mechanisms of oppression um, do not just reside in stigma. It is deeply interconnected with legislation and the economics um, that mean that people have to turn to sex work. Harm reduction can be done now, and at the same time, we can still work on more radical solutions to target the root of the problem and ultimately figure out how to end poverty and precarity, as well as border imperialism, white supremacy, patriarchy and capitalism. So that's our to-do list. Um, no big deal. <laughs> and, um, yeah, thank you so much for having us. And we uh love to have a blether if folk are up for it <laughs> thanks so much guys that was that was really really good um yeah we've got 15 minutes for questions um so you can either type it in the chat box or i'll try and spot people if you put your hands up um and I'll, yeah i'll try and do it as well as i can there's quite a lot of us here so um yeah if your camera is turned off just add it to the chat box if you've got any questions um, I can see Bunny, so if we come to you first, just because I can see you first. Hello, hi, thank you so much for that. Um, I just wanted to ask, so most of my friends who are sex workers are engaged in some sort of legislative um, kind of work, trying to defend, you know, sex workers' rights within the Labour Party or whatever, but I'm just wondering, like, what I can do as an anarcho-syndicalist specifically to support your Labour rights? So, I mean, like, I think that getting, it depends how, how involved you are in the, in the wider trade union movement. I think um, there have been attempts to unionize sex workers with sort of mainstream, um, mainstream union, unions, most recently the GMB, um, because that's a, a big behemoth neoliberal uh, garbage fire. It wasn't great. So um, it didn't really work out that great. But um, yeah, sex workers are currently uh, unionized with the UVW and IWW. And I think that that's kind of where, where our struggle is, is with other, other marginalized workers. And um, yeah, I just, I think supporting, supporting the idea that um, regardless of morality and all of that, all of that nonsense, um, it's it's labor and therefore should be covered by labor rights and um, labor protections um yeah and i think up in scotland we've definitely got a way to go to to get some more involvement in the labor party um as well as they are say at the snp because they they do not like sex workers <laughs> um on the most part um but yeah like that is important sides to the work as well it's just pretty unforgiving sometimes <laughs> Um, someone's put in the chat, um, um, are there any parties that um, support decriminalisation? And Elizabeth has typed back um, the Green Party and the Lib Dems to, um, yeah. Yeah, um, it's sweet of the Lib Dems to try. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the, um, the Green Party and then there are, there's like Labour for Decrim and um, like lots of bits of the STUC and of the SNP and people like the uh, Black Workers Committee and the STUC, the um, I believe the Disabled Workers Committee, the Women's Committee definitely do not. <laughs> um, so 
so yeah if anyone's involved in that then that's uh that's a difficult fight to take on but if you're up for it then that's the kind of allyship that we really need um is trying to trying to claw our way into the more swerfy feminists and um feminist scenes <laughs> Has anyone else got any other questions? Oh, um, is it Ellie? Yeah, hi. Thank you so much for this. Um, really, really interesting talk. Um, I'm wondering, because I know you said the Greens support it, and it seems like discussions are really like at peak with the Greens and SNP working together. And since the SNP is so like into their equally safe motto, I'm wondering like, what can we do? Is there sort of more petitions and stuff we can sign now after the consultation has gone through to try to get the Greens to make that maybe a priority in their negotiations. Do you know, is there nothing yet? <laughs> Do we need to start something? I mean, yeah, I guess starting something is always good. I kind of don't really have much of a vein for like parliamentary stuff. It all is kind of mind boggling. Um, but I'm sure that other people in Scott Pip would have good suggestions. <laughs> Um, I mean, I, I do think it's, it's it's super slowly changing, but it is happening. And like the, the election results, uh, when we sort of dug into them more recently, we were like, oh, actually, like a couple of the big baddies have lost their seats and uh, some some allies have gotten in. So I do, there's, there's a sea change, but um, yeah, we are fighting fighting against the sort of mainstream feminist movement and the politicians who really desperately want to be seen as like good feminists but just so they just go to the, the next big person who'll tell them this is how you do it um but yeah I would I would really love to work on stuff like that with Scott Pepp and put together more resources for people reaching out to their MSPs and things like this um we haven't actually linked to our website, which we should have done. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll now. Yeah, I'll put it in the chat now. But yeah, it's definitely something we should do more because I think obviously um, for them, it's a career, isn't it? So they need to do what they think people want. So I suppose more people will contact them about it, then it will be prioritised more. And yeah, when there are consultations, which there are just all the time, I don't honestly, I don't know why they love consultations so much because they don't bloody listen to them. Um, and it just means that we're exhausted. But when there are consultations, it's so, so helpful to have people like just spamming them basically and just like filling them out as much as possible. Um, and yeah, they just, it seems like one one gets like half put to bed and then they're like, let's make another one. So. <laughs> um, has anyone got one final question? Ooh, why do you think swerf sentiment has become so prevalent in a lot of the feminist scene spaces? Um, I mean, have we got another hour? Uh, <laughs> so I, I've been developing my own little theory on this recently, which I slightly, I like half picked up on, um, where they sort of project all women onto us. Um, so the client becomes the archetypal like male aggressor um, and we become the archetypal like female victim, woman victim. And I, I, I do, I think it comes from a place of trauma where this is me trying to be really charitable, where they are like trying to deal with their own gender trauma um, by going, I can see it. I can visually see some really obvious like gender stuff going on here. I need to stop it. Um, but then they do that by being really awful to other women primarily other women but not only other women um and there's something incredibly like classist about focusing so much on your internal understanding of the way that you've experienced uh gender-based violence um but then making making other people's experiences which are probably like more acute to be honest like if you're selling sex that is like, I mean, for, for me anyway, my understanding of it was like, that is a, it's a pretty extreme form of those like gender relations being played out. So yeah, I've got this little, this like theory 
bubbling away in my head about how they basically it's a projection um, of of their own experiences and their own very real traumas onto people who they just have no business projecting onto. Like our struggles are different. Um, and the cat's name is Luciente. Uh, <laughs> Because he's a very fancy lad. <laughs> so I'm a very fancy name. <laughs> um, maybe I didn't explain that super well, but it also, I mean, it stems also from like, you know, Victorian morality nonsense and seeing us as purveyors of disease. And it's super linked in with um, Borges and things as well. Um, Red Canary Song, who I mentioned earlier, I went to a conference where they did this really incredible history of um, like particularly Asian sex work in America um, where they like showed all of these awful, awful posters about um, basically sort of like, the, um, like either white slavery or like, like Asian Chinese women being like snuck in through borders and it, really hideous stuff. But um, yeah, there's all of these like lines of horrible shit that have weirdly coalesced into some form of bizarre feminism. 